Hi, I'm Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, my co-host Judy Scutch Whitson and I will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. Now here's your program. Judy, how you doing? Hi there, Matthew. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Me too. I understand we're talking about your sister. What can you tell us about there? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell a fairly long sibling story. So please interrupt me anytime you want. Uh, This is something that's just becoming clearer to me now. Uh, I know that many psychologists have said, and I actually read a book once about the sibling relationship is actually the most impactful and important one of your life. Um, I had never thought that was true. I always thought it was parents. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in many cases that is absolutely true. So this may or may not (laughs) shed light with uh, some of you listeners about the sibling relationship. And I'm going to tell a story. And the story is about my relationship with my younger sister, Carol. First of all, my sister Carol and I, I would say, had a very good relationship. It was good, number one, because I was nine years older. And therefore, there was no jealousy that I saw in my life towards my sister when she was born. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, As I was nine years old, and one of my favorite things to do and to play with when I was younger was baby dolls. I loved to diaper them, and I loved to feed them bottles, and I loved to burp them, and dolls were pretty sophisticated at that time. And I had a carriage for a doll, so you could see. I was either on the way to motherhood or I was preparing for something. <laughs> and looking back on it now, I was preparing for the birth of my younger sister. Because when she was born, I always called her my baby. And um, my mother was very generous. And in fact, I think she relied upon me a lot because I did seem to be somewhat competent, even at the age of nine. And I was hands-on with this little girl uh, until she was about seven or eight um, when I went away to college. So in a sense, looking back on my childhood, I can say we were two only children because of the age difference. And I was away for the rest of my life from my family home by the time I was just 17 years old. And therefore, she was eight. It couldn't have been any other way for me to see how she grew day by day and be with her as the different birthdays went by and see her evolve into a teenager. I could when I came home on vacation. And the summers, I usually went someplace else, and she went away to summer camp. So what we had together was our very, very close, almost older sister slash mommy relationship that we had from the time that she was born until I went away. And then, of course, she started to grow. Uh, We certainly saw each other. We're a very close family. Uh, My parents not only had us, but other siblings of each of their own and all living near each other. So we had a very busy home on holidays and even on regular Sundays, the house was chock full of relatives of all ages. I'm painting this picture because it is not necessarily like your picture or someone else's picture. There are not often only two siblings that are almost a decade apart. And because of that, I think there were a lot of things that I overlooked in our growing up and apart and then back again together. When my sister was in high school, she went to the same high school I did. The first I ever thought about it was I was holding my very colicky 
six-month-old baby in my arms who was having projectile vomiting. And my sister called, and she was in the dean's office. She had a job helping the dean. And she said to me, I just looked up the records from when you went to school here, and you're not as smart as I thought you were. And she hung up. <laughs> it didn't affect me. <laughs> Can't that hear that much. enough. Yeah. At the time, because I wasn't very interested in high school. And I knew that I had done well enough <laughs> and that my sister was very smart. And <laughs> so she found out maybe her grades were higher than mine. But as I said, I was busy with a newborn son. My sister also was my favorite babysitter. We lived in the same city, and my parents would bring her over if my husband and I wanted to go out to dinner and a movie. And I trusted her completely with my baby boy because he seemed to adore her. And she seemed to feel the same way about him that I did about her. So that was delightful. Well, I had another child eventually, three and a half years after my son was born, my daughter was born. So now I had two kids. <laughs> And a lot to look after. And by this time, my sister was a teenager. And then eventually, she was about 18. And she met the man of her dreams, which I think was an ancient relationship because they did recognize each other right away. He was a couple of years older. And by the time she was 19, she was married. Not finished yet with college, but she transferred to where he was going to be going to graduate school so they could be together. And she got pregnant right away. And at 20 years old, my sister had twins. I was the first person she called. I don't think it was from the recovery room. She must have been back in her room already. But she called me and she said, ha, ha, ha. I had a boy and a girl together at the same time. It took you two tries. And that's the way I found out the babies were born. I should have gotten the idea a little bit then that there was some rivalry and it wasn't from me to her because I had no reason to ever feel as if she was getting the better of the deal. But she must have grown up thinking that because I was older, things were happening to me way before they could happen to her. The parents weren't taking a six-year-old out to dinner or on a trip with them or to the opera, or to a concert, or to the theater. And of course, there was a resentment, and there must have been. But honestly, I don't ever remember even thinking about it. But those two remarks caught me by surprise. I, I just couldn't imagine what she was harboring, that there was a competition between us. But I do think it was in her mind. And I didn't think much about it. In fact, I'm talking much more about it now than I ever even thought about. It. Well, life went on. And as I said, we were a very close family. She moved to Boston area. I still lived in New York near my parents. Uh, we were very, very close. I saw my parents often. My sister would come in from Boston. They would travel up to Boston we were together on holidays, on vacations, on birthdays, all sorts of special occasions. We managed to get to each other and be in each other's homes. And our children, therefore, became very close, too. Uh, there was not too much difference between my two children and her three because she got married and had children younger than I did, which made it very nice. I think that we were emotionally close because we wanted to be. And I knew a good bit about her life and she knew a good bit about my life. But when A Course in Miracles came into my life, something shifted. And this could, I can't even really express it in words except I was aware, number one, that my sister considered herself an atheist. And number two, that she felt that I was being very misguided by this material called A Course of Miracles, which she never looked at. And I was also spending an inordinate amount of time with the people who were the scribes of the course. And I noticed when we would have our 
Sunday conversations, which was every Sunday, that if I mentioned something about it, she just kept quiet and she would change the subject. So there was this invisible wall that went up between us because the most important thing in my life I felt I couldn't share with her. I knew that someday we would be together and in some way all of this would be in the past and she who was very interested in doing her doctoral degree and was about to start um, would have a great deal to tell me about her work too and that we probably would be able to exchange thoughts in an easier way. But that never happened. And the reason that never happened is because my dad died in 1986. And uh, a few years before he died, I got very strong inner guidance that as they were aging and beginning to have health problems, my husband and I should go back to New York City, sell their house for them and bring them to California to live with us. And my sister was very antagonistic to the idea. She felt you don't move people at that age. It's not good for them. They'll be miserable being away from everything they knew. They lived in the same house 58 years. But my guidance was very strong. And so when we went back to move my parents, she managed to go to Africa with her husband on a safari and not be around. <laughs> but we got them settled and they were with us for a few months when she came out to visit with her husband. And a very very loving and magnanimous way. She said, you know, I was wrong. I thought moving them was a terrible idea. And I think that they're going to be very, very happy here. She said, but I have to tell you that I feel very guilty because I have nothing to do with it anymore. And frankly, I don't want to. And I said to her, I thanked her for her honesty. And I said, you don't have to feel guilt. I've always known I can't explain it to you, but I've always known deep inside myself that I would be caring for our parents someday. But if there's something that you want to do to become part of it, I can't stand paperwork. You know I'm terrible at math. There's a lot of work to do with, with Medicare and all their doctors and all of these filings. And she said, I'll do it. I'll do it. I love to do that kind of work. And so I considered a really good trade. As far as I was concerned, we were both taking care of my parents. She was on a visit once and came to California to see my parents and me. And we were driving in a car. My mother was in the front seat. I was the driver. My sister was in the back seat. And Bob Scutch, my ex-husband, had just written a book about A Course in Miracles describing how it came. The Course of Miracles, a story of A Course of Miracles. And um, I had automatically put her on the list of people to send books to. So my mother said to her, uh, Carol, did you get the book that Bob wrote? And Carol said, yeah. And my mother said, what'd you think of it? And she said, are you kidding? When I saw what it was, I threw it in the trash. So again, Although we never talked about it, I realized that there was something. The course was very antithetical in her life. She, she did not want to go in that direction, not in any direction, not in any spiritual tradition, any religion. Uh, she was very careful, and her children grew up that way. Now, that wasn't a terrible thing. In fact, I sort of thought it was kind of funny because it she was so honest about it. She was always very honest, and she was so honest about it. And that's the way it was going to be. The year after my father died in 1986 was going to be my mother's 80th birthday, and my mother was very much alive. And my sister and I decided that she would come to California with her three children, and we'd have other relatives, and my children would come. And we'd all celebrate my mother's 80th birthday. And about two weeks before, I got a telephone call from my niece, my sister's firstborn, of the twins, 20 minutes, or 20 minutes older than her brother, called me. And she was crying on the telephone. And she said, Aunt Judy, mom and dad are missing. I, I said, what do you mean missing? She said, well, you know, they had their plane on Nantucket which is where they were for the summer, Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts. 
and they went on a very short trip to visit someone living at Cape Cod for a party for the day. And they left there around nine o'clock at night to come back to Nantucket, which was a 40 minute flight. And they never landed. And nobody knows what happened to them. That was the beginning of a period in my life of tremendous shock and loss and adjusted activity because, as I said, we're a very close family and her children and my children were close. And of course, I was close to my two nieces and my nephew. And she had left in her will uh, and her husband's will in case anything happens to the two of them. I would take the children. Well, the children were then young adults. They were all out of university and in graduate school. One of them was finished with graduate school. And they didn't need taking care of, but they were three children of my sister who had no parents suddenly. And it was as much of a shock as it was for them, it was for me, and of course, my mother. It was a very, very difficult time. And I felt as if I had become more of an aunt, that I had become, as my niece would eventually call me, Auntie Mom, and that I had a job to do, which I wanted to do with all my heart, was becoming even closer and more involved in their daily lives than I would have been had my sister been there around to be doing those, those, that part of growing and those tasks for them. like graduation parties and weddings and things like that. And then, of course, eventually children being born. And it was a blessing that came out of a horror story, but it didn't mean that I missed her and her husband less. That never went away. It's 33 years now, and it still hasn't gone away. Life goes on, and we adjust to the various vicissitudes. And with the course of my life, of course, I naturally was concentrating as much as I could upon forgiveness. Now, as the course says, and many of you who have been following these podcasts already know, and many of you are students of the course and I know very well, um, we're not talking about forgiveness in the sense of the world, the way the world interprets forgiveness. I will be better than my than this person in this situation. I will rise above it and I will forgive her for the terrible thing she just did to me or him for the terrible thing he said or my boss for firing me or my mother for whatever, whatever thing was said that made me feel bad. Uh, but forgiveness is to recognize that we are living in a world of duality and the course addresses not duality, but oneness. So therefore, duality is considered in A Course of Miracles and many other traditions, by the way, as a dream state. We are in a dream. We are asleep. I remember when I first read in the course, this particular quote, this is in the Bible, says that <coughs> God made Adam fall into a deep sleep. And no place does the Bible ever say he awakened. And the course goes on to say, using that as an example, there will be no awakening until we recognize that this is not our home, that we are living in a world of form, of physicality, of birth, of death, of illness, of joy, of happiness, of sorrow, death, the end. That is not what the Course teaches at all. It teaches us that we are eternal and we are dreaming of this life where we are separate, we're split off, we are not one. We don't see our interests as the same. And the purpose of A Course in Miracles and the lessons that it gives us to do each day for a year is to let us work this out in our minds, turn our minds around 180 degrees from everything we've taught and from all what we think we've experienced is true, and to re-examine ourselves in the light of 
the lessons of the Course, which provides us with the voice for God or the Holy Spirit within, which is within everyone, whether they believe anything or not, within everyone, and will help guide our way. The more we become aware of our internal guidance, of our higher teacher, of anything we want to call it, of Jesus as the author of the Course, the more aware we are, the closer we recognize that our partnership is with that part of our mind, which is still in right-mindedness, which is still aware of its connection with the all, with God as our source. At that point, we can see what forgiveness truly is. It's basically forgiving not only other people and seeing them in light, but forgiving ourselves for thinking they did anything to be with to us at all because it is only a dream. And the more we shift our awareness into that concept, the more we can understand what forgiveness is. So I've been at this a long time, 45 years to be exact, and it isn't easy. I've never said it's easy correcting one's mind. It's like peeling off one very thin skin of the onion at a time and trying to get to the core of the knowledge, the acceptance, the complete and absolute identification with God as our source. Back to the system. These are the thoughts that I've been thinking over the years and the, and the teaching I've been following over the years since she's disappeared. I still say disappeared instead of died because I, in my mind, that's what happened. She disappeared. And um, I never doubted that the last week that I saw her and spent time with her on the island of Nantucket for a week vacation and walked the beaches with her and had an absolutely wonderful time. I never doubted afterwards that that was a great gift to me to know that I could be in intimacy with my sister. And that is what happened before she disappeared. A few weeks before she disappeared, I was with her. And I was with her for the first time in many years without my partner, my husband, without my children. My mother was there too, but she couldn't walk the beaches with us. and She couldn't go shopping with us. But we were together, and I felt a remarkable level of healing was reached just by our being together. Again, no conversation about the spiritual life, nothing. A few days later, I was talking to her on the telephone, and she was crying. And I said, what did I do? <laughs> How did I say anything to offend you? No, no, no. She said, I just can't stop crying since you and mom left. And I said, why? She goes, because I know I'm never going to see you again. I said, mom's birthday is in two weeks. You'll be in California. We'll all be together. She said, I know, I know, but I can't help it. I feel I'm never going to see you again. And she never did. That started to make me think, aren't we all aware at some level that deep within us is a part of us that transcends our everyday working, living mentalities. For my sister to say to me in deep tears that sounded almost like grief, I know I'm never going to see you and mom again. And at the same time to say, yes, I know in two weeks I'll be there. So in other words, saying what I'm thinking is kind of stupid. Um, I I didn't get the impact of it, and all I could do was assure her that, you know, I, I, I'm sorry that, that she's having this feeling, and I know it's going to go away, and I'll see her very soon, which, of course, I didn't. As I said, the years went by, 33 of the years, and as I'm thinking more and more about where there are relationships in my life, that I don't feel complete healing. I never thought of my sister. 
all sorts of other relationships where I have consciously prayed, asked for help, asked for guidance. There have been wonderful over the years, wonderful shifts where I do not see these people anymore as have offended me or hurt me in any way. I see them as the Course tells us we can. I see them with the eyes of vision, Christ's vision. I see them as one with me, even though their personalities may not have changed. They could be exactly the same in the way they act towards other people. It doesn't matter. I see their reality. And it's happened over and over again so that I live in a great deal of fulfillment and actually happiness. Not long after my son and his wife were married at a wedding in Princeton, New Jersey, I got a telephone call. And the telephone call was from a man whose name I vaguely remembered. I'll call him David Aaron. And he told me this. He said, I was suddenly really obsessed with having to talk to your sister again. I was her first and only boyfriend before she married Steve. And I said, I remember you. You sometimes came with my with my sister to babysit for my ch my child when he was a baby. He said, that's right. And I said, my goodness, why, why am I getting this call from you now? He said, do you know, I just found out that your sister was no longer with us. And I said, what do you mean you just found out? He said, well, I've been out of the country for many, many years. And I was uh, vaguely in touch with your sister and her husband. And uh, it seems they read an article about me in the New York Times and the work that I was doing. In He was in Asia. And he had become fairly well known for the excellent work that he was doing there. But he wasn't living here in our country. He was living in Asia. And he said, I've been back now and I'm living in Hawaii. And you know how it happens when you get older. You think so much about your past and what has shaped you. I've written a few books, he said, and the first one that I wrote, I never published and won't, but it was about your sister. And I said, it was about my sister. He said, Judy, she was my first love, my only love forever. And I just started to cry. I couldn't believe that there was someone in this world who knew my sister for the years that I didn't know her well at all when she was a very young teenager until she met her husband and then got married. And he sent me the book to read, and it just opened up the floodgates. And I realized how incomplete in my own mind my healing was with my younger sister. Because, in a sense, I had kept this veil between us since I was fearful of a disapproval of my work with the Course in Miracles. And it turns out that this man is no longer a young man. He's only about nine years younger than I am. But it turned out that he himself went in a very definite spiritual direction. And he told me about the talks that he and my sister used to have late at night when they were just mid-teenagers for hours, that would be about the deepest part of their thoughts, the deepest understands in their mind. They're groping for some kind of sense in this world, and they were each other's confidants and fellow explorers. They were on that journey too. I've kept very close in touch with David, and he's written a couple of books since, and of course, I always delighted to have his books. But that first book that he wrote, that talked about his love for my sister, always has never, ever left my heart. Recently, with the holidays, I sent him a holiday card, and he wrote me back with a couple of pictures to see uh, where he was right now, which is still in Hawaii, and that a new book of his had come out. And he said to me, you know, 
I don't know how you treasure the memories of her, but you recently sent me a picture of her that you had taken, and she was all eyes. My sister had enormous, very dark eyes, and they were very expressive. People used to call them black cherries. And he said, I took one look at that picture, and this was 20 years after I had last seen her. And I started to weep again because I got lost in those eyes. And we were both weeping on the telephone as recently as last week because he reminded me once again that I had recovered that time that I had lost by being away so early in her life and not watching her grow. And he had given the best part of that back to me through the book that he wrote about her and through his conversations with me. And just yesterday, last night, as I was thinking about this podcast that we're going to do today, I was wondering, do I still have any stories to tell about forgiveness? And I said, my goodness, I can finally say, that my relationship with my sister in my mind is totally healed. I don't feel as if the course of all things has kept us apart. It was always within her as it is within me, whether she spoke it or not. There was an awareness. If we think that somebody isn't capable of understanding our spiritual path, someone else's spiritual path, or a spiritual identity at all. It doesn't mean they're any less than we are. They are the same. We are all the same. We all are pieces of the whole. And in following A Course of Miracles, I know that's where our reuniting is. Um, Just in closing, I was reading something in the course the other day, and I realized this morning that this fits quite well. Uh, For those of you, again, who are not familiar with the course, just let the words wash over you. For those of you who know the course very well, you might even know where it's from. Uh, It's actually from the text. And it goes like this. Your relationship with your brother, and the word brother is used for really the other. It could be sister, brother, it doesn't matter. It's not a gender-associated word, but it uses brother. Your relationship with your brother has been uprooted from the world of shadows. It's been uprooted. I had my relationship with my sister in the world of shadows, and I didn't realize it. And its unholy purpose has been safely brought through the barriers of guilt, washed with forgiveness and set shining and firmly rooted in the world of light. From there, it calls to you to follow the course it took, lifted high above the darkness and gently placed before the gates of heaven. The holy instant in which you and your brother were united is but the messenger of love sent from beyond forgiveness to remind you of all what lies beyond it. And yet it is through forgiveness that it will be remembered. And it touches me so much when I read this and I realize how perfectly that sums up this particular situation, my particular story of my relationship with my younger sister, Carol. It's been uprooted from the world of shadows. And its unholy purpose, which is separateness, has been safely brought through the barriers of guilt, washed with forgiveness, at set shining and firmly rooted in the world of light. I wish you all the happiness of incidences like those in your life, no matter how long it takes. These things don't happen overnight, usually because we're not willing to let go of our guilt. It's guilt that this world is made of. The building blocks of this world 
our guilt as we release them one by one in every situation and every relationship we get into the habit of it and eventually we began to feel more and more in the light than in the darkness and there is our hope and there is our salvation Judy, when you mention guilt like that, I mean, it's people are probably wrestling with guilt with uh, relationships. You, you talked about your relationship with your sister who's no longer here, but you went through this process of, you know, forgiveness with her, even though she's passed. Do you have any recommendations for people that are wrestling with guilt and they think, well, I can't do anything because the person's gone? I mean, how do you? How do you go through that process of letting it up like that and kind of forgiving it? First of all, the Course asks us to accept the atonement, which, by the way, in the Course, the word atonement really is another word for correction, for ourselves to correct our minds from the sense that we are separate and that we can get ill and we can have unholy relationships and that we can die. So in accepting the atonement or correction for ourselves, that's all we really have to do. It is not dependent upon the other person changing at all. Now, why should it be any different from a person who has left his, her body and is no longer in body, in the world of form? world that we made. If we dare to believe, as the Course tells us is true, that when you leave your body, (laughs) there is no death. You can discard the body, sure, like an old overcoat, not useful any longer, but you still are because we are constantly learning. And what are we learning? We're learning what we are in truth, and we are going back to that light from whence we came. But it is our process of willingness to do that that makes all the difference. Why should it be any different if, say, I had a terrible relationship with my father and he dies and I am mourning how terrible it is that we died in such anger at each other? Well, why can't I continue to learn and to grow and to recognize that certainly happened in the world of form but it was not a question of fault. It was a question of how I perceived it. I can change my mind at any time. And also, I have a partner that is within, called the Holy Spirit, the internal teacher, the higher guide, to help me do it. It doesn't matter whether the person is embodied or is long past if one wants to see that person's light, which still is and exists within you too, then you will follow a particular way to help you get there and you will get all the help you need. Uh, We're told A Course in Miracles is not the only way, it's only one of many. And when Helen first started to scribe the Course, she asked questions. And one of the questions she asked is, why is it coming to me? And the answer is, because you'll do the job. Well, she was very practical and pragmatic, so that was fine. Well, then, why is it coming now? Because never before, it answered, has the world been calling out so clearly for spiritual help, for the awareness of another way. And this is one of the many that are being given. So knowing the eternal nature of what we call spirit, we can also understand then the eternal nature of ourselves. And then it makes it so much easier to understand that it's our minds that need correcting. I don't have to face my sister and say, I'm sorry that I held something against you, even unwittingly, because you weren't interested in the course of miracles. Will you forgive me? That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about me seeing her as a beautiful golden light with no flaws, because she is flawless, as am I. 
And what about when, you know, you have a relationship and it feels difficult and you do your best job forgiveness with forgiveness as you were just talking about, you know, not forgiving, overlooking, but realizing, you know, I'm, you know, I'm dreaming here and I, it's not real. And you're going through that process and then you see the person again and it doesn't feel like it's healed. In fact, it feels like, am I even making progress? What, what do you say in that situation? Well, of course, talks about <clears throat> us all as teachers of God, which may sound a little bit too lofty for many of us when we first come across it, but we are all teachers of what we believe, whether it's in politics or it's in food choices or it's in health issues. What we believe is what we're witnessing is what we're doing. So if we believe that there is a particular relationship that can symbolize many for us, where we don't feel harmony, where we feel grievances, where we have grievances, where we hold grievances, and we make the decision that I would like to see this differently, and that's the first of all the important decisions you make, recognizing that there's a problem. It's not his problem. It's not her problem. It is a problem. It's your problem. It's how you are seeing someone and that you're willing to ask the self within you that knows for help and help guide you to it. You can be sure that this will be happening. Does it happen overnight? Well, I can't say in my experience that I ever witnessed this happening overnight. I do know that people work for a long time and maybe years on recognizing the level of grievances they hold against people. Uh, you don't see another person changing. You see yourself changing. If that person, for instance, is a very close family member and has pushed your buttons for years since childhood, well, I would think if your intention really is to see this relationship differently and you're promised through your study of the course that you will, I would think that you could give it the patience and the time. And patience is an attribute of a teacher of God. The course has in the teacher's manual spelled out very carefully what are the attributes of a teacher of God. And patience is there loud and clear. We need to have patience patience. We need to practice. To me, practice and patience go together because that's been my path. But to expect something to change immediately because you say, okay, now I'd like to forgive this person. There's so much more work involved. Unless we do the work, we're not going to get to the goal. Um, I think I may have mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. I remember some woman calling me and telling me how difficult it was. And she's working with the course for five years and she doesn't see any change in her mother. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, do you feel any change in yourself towards her? Well, I don't yet, but I feel that I want to. I said, well, that's excellent. She said, well, why is it taking so long? And I really couldn't give her an answer except to instantly go inside, as I always do, and yell, help. And my shortcut help is I know who I'm talking to when I say help. I'm talking to my inner teacher. Please help me. And without even thinking, I said to her, do you uh, practice a sport? Oh, I'm a runner. I said, uh, are you a serious runner? Oh, yes. I didn't start out that way, but I really am now. I've got a certain amount of miles a day. I don't know if she said five or 10 miles a day. And I said, have you ever been in a marathon? Oh, yeah. I'm in a marathon once a year where I live. And I said, so how many hours a day would you say you practice running? And she said, oh, well, sometimes I could practice. I could be running for three hours. I could do it twice a day or once a day. But I try to get in three hours of running a day. And I said, really? Well, are you accomplishing your goal? Yes, I'm getting better and better. I said, why would you think that you should put less time into studying practicing A Course in Miracles, if you want to achieve your goal. 
And she stopped and she said, I never thought of it that way, but you know, I think it's harder. I said, yes, it is harder to change your mind because you have the whole world that you've made all around you to keep on distracting you, but it can be done with practice. And that's what the lessons are for. So good for you. Keep out of it. All of a sudden you'll see it start to change. Like you put in so much time and suddenly you reach a critical mass and you say, my goodness, I'm thinking about this a good bit of the day now. I'm looking at many of my relationships the same way. You keep on practicing and you keep the same goal. You will succeed. The course itself tells us that a happy outcome to all things is certain. And the things we're talking about is to recognizing our source. Well, Judy, that seems like a great place to stop. Thanks so much for relating these stories. You got so many great stories. I think that we all have great stories. It's a question of how much time again, that's what time is for. How much time do we give ourselves to thinking these things through with the goal in mind of wanting to change our minds from fear to love? With that goal in mind, how much time do we give ourselves? You know, no one's, no one's measuring it for you. You're not taking an exam. It's up to you. That's what time is for. And so the more you're involved in this, obviously, the more stories you're going to have. And remembering these incidences, each one builds on the one before so that it gets stronger and stronger and stronger in you. The stories themselves are not important. The process is. Well, thanks again, Judy. This is wonderful. I really learned a lot as always, and I look forward to our next podcast. So do I. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.